Okay, uh, it's time to start the, uh, the afternoon's session. <clears throat> uh, are you ready? Uh, yes, ah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So the first speaker, um, <laughs> this is second talk in the afternoon session, so sorry. Okay, so the, <clears throat> the, yeah, so the speaker of this session is uh, Sun Ju Li uh, from IBS CTPU. And uh, the title is On Light Towers of uh, States at Infinite Distances. Please stop. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so <clears throat> I'd first like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. <clears throat> Today, I'll be telling you about light towers of states at infinite distances. The talk will base on uh, these works done <clears throat> with various collaborators, uh, Daniel Klauer and Timo Weigand at Hamburg, Max Wiesner at Harvard and Wolfgang Lehe uh, at CERN. <clears throat> and these two last papers will appear on the archive sometime this week, at least that's the plan. <clears throat> so you could check them out for more details in case you uh, get interested in some of our recent results, which I will uh, be reporting on <clears throat> in the later part of this talk. So <clears throat> for a brief introduction, let's start by recalling the uh, central notion <clears throat> of the landscape. <clears throat> um, at very high energies, we have a UV quantum gravity, which in this talk will be string theory. Uh, it is a very constrained theory uh, and it's represented by a single point at this high energy in the theory space. But once we flow down into low energies, this um, almost unique theory leads to a vast set of uh, uh, low energy models. <clears throat> and that is the landscape of uh, string effective field theories. Uh, the single UV theory here has lots of vacua and each of them gives a different uh, low energy effective physics. So by construction, any models in the landscape does have a UV completion into quantum gravity. On the other hand, as it turns out, there exist lots of apparently consistent low energy quantum field theory models, which nevertheless cannot be completed into quantum gravity. And the set of such incomplete theories is known as the swamplet. Of course, this division of the theory space is well-defined, but it might not be useful unless we could come up with any concrete practical criteria uh, by which the landscape EFTs can be distinguished from the swampland EFTs. And in this context, <clears throat> swampland conjectures is a general term which refers to any consistency constraints that quantum gravity is believed to impose on general ground. The validity of such constraints is sometimes debatable, which is rather unfortunate, uh, but modulo this for a given low energy theory, we can test if it obeys the constraints. And if it fails any of them, we may dump it into the swamplet. Uh, and determining such consistency constraints and also uncovering the very nature of quantum gravity along the way is the major goal of the so-called swampland program. These constraints, once established, will also serve uh, as an intellectual guidance towards new physics effects, uh, which is an exciting opportunity. <clears throat> the set of swampland conjectures has been expanding very fast, and this is a very partial subset. Of course, it's not the aim of this talk to discuss all of this, but let me at least point out that they are uh, very much connected uh, forming an intricate and very interesting web structure. Arguably, at the heart of this web is the so-called distance conjecture on which I'll focus today. In fact, in addressing this uh, famous conjecture, I'll be invoking the uh, emergent string conjecture, which has recently been put forward as a refinement of the distance conjecture. Specifically, the goal of this talk is then to address these two conjectures for a whole class of string effective field theories in a model independent fashion via universal properties of the compactification geometries. <clears throat> so firstly, what is the distance conjecture? The claim goes as follows. 
given a quantum graph, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> given a quantum gravity theory with a scalar field, we consider traversing an infinite distance in the moduli space. In other words, we consider deforming the theory a lot towards the boundary of the effective field theory parameter space. Then the claim is that an infinite tower of states should become light there uh, in this exponential fashion. And this alpha here in the exponent is also conjectured to be an order one constant in Planck unit. <clears throat> So this statement has indeed been confirmed in, in many string effective field theories, but uh, this still remains a conjecture. To better understand or to establish this, uh, it is important to reveal the very nature or the origin of the light tower of states. And along this line, the emergent string con conjecture has come out, which claims that at infinite distance, the theory either decompactifies or reduces to a weakly coupled string theory. <clears throat> this is a refinement of the distance conjecture because uh, this former situation would lead to uh, a light KK tower and this latter situation to a light string tower. <clears throat> what evidence do we have? Uh, in case you view this uh, decompactification as a rather boring part, what may still be striking to you is the following. Uh, it has been confirmed in highly non-trivial string setups that a unique critical tensional string emerges via the universal behavior of the compactification geometry in the asymptotic region of the modular space. The confirmed setups include uh, <clears throat> the Keller sectors of F, M, and type two theories on Calabi-L threefolds, M theory on G2, and eventually four-dimensional F theory, both in the classical and in the quantum context. And let me emphasize that this last setup provides the least supersymmetric arena one could think of, and therefore the most general physical structure should be visible there uh, as far as supersymmetric EFTs are concerned at least. <clears throat> so what comes next is then a brief report on the claimed physics at infinite distance in the Keller moduli of four-dimensional F theory. Uh, because the results here are already uh, over one year old, I'll be very quick about them uh, and I will omit most of the details. Then in this second part, I will switch gears to uh, talk more, uh, uh, to, to talk about more, more recent results on the complex structure moduli uh, in the eight-dimensional F3 setup. And in this part, I will actually try to provide a little bit of details uh, to get you uh, more concrete ideas. So that's the plan. Uh, <clears throat> are there any questions so far about the introduction? <clears throat> if not, uh, let me now start with the Keller sector. <clears throat> so the arena is four-dimensional n equals one F theory, which is another name for type 2 V-string theory on a compact six manifold X6. We consider seven brains on its four cycle uh, S4 here. Uh, and the external four dimensional gauge fields uh, arise here. Uh, these brains source a non-trivial uh, axial dilaton profile. And this can be described via an elliptic vibration over the internal space X6. And we may also assume a generic gauge flux. The couplings of the effective field theory are governed by the Keller volumes of the internal space X6 and its four cycle S wrapped by the seven brains. So the Keller sector of the moduli space, <clears throat> which we will focus on, controls those couplings of the EFTs. Uh, we have the uh, parameters tau i's <clears throat> in the Keller form expansion. And uh, roughly speaking, uh, these tau i's are the two cycle volumes. Uh, their squares are the four cycle volumes and their cube is the uh, entire uh, volume of the six manifold X. Now we want to classify the physics at infinite distance of this moduli space. To this end, we will first classify the geometry at infinite distance. 
uh, in which one or more of the tau parameters, the Keller parameters, will be taken to infinity. And generically, <clears throat> the volume of the entire uh, internal space X would diverge in such a limit. But then we may factor out the infinity through uh, the large parameter mu. So we are naturally led to rescale these uh, large tau parameters to uh, Ti's in such a way that the volume of X in terms of these rescaled Keller parameters Ti's may become finite. <clears throat> Of course, the simplest situation um, um, occurs when all these rescaled TIs are uh, finite. And this describes a homogeneous decompactification due to the uh, just the overall scaling mu. And obviously, a light KK tower uh, emerges of which scale is computed as mu to the minus four, where mu is the large parameter. In general, however, <clears throat> uh, such an overall scaling can come along with a relative scaling. Uh, this happens when uh, some of these rescaled parameters are also large. So this is in a sense, a residual infinity. Uh, and, and, and importantly, if uh, some TIs are large, then some other TIs should be small. And this is because the rescaled volume uh, is finite and the volume of X is essentially the cube of the Keller parameters. So if some are large, then some others should be small. <clears throat> Therefore, we necessarily have some shrinking two cycles uh, in the geometry. And this turn, turns out to play an important role for physics uh, as I will now address. <clears throat> so our classification result can be summarized like this. As already explained, the geometry in the limit uh, if it involves a relative scaling as well, uh, must have some shrinking to cycles. And in some limits, <clears throat> uh, there may be a unique two cycle that shrinks at a fastest parametric rate. Uh, and uh, this turns out to be uh, either a rational fiber or an elliptic fiber of the six manifold X. <clears throat> um, in those cases, the D3 brains present in the theory, once wrapped on this shrinking two cycle, leads to a tensionless uh, heterotic in the uh, genus zero case and type two in the uh, genus one case uh, string. And uh, uh, in turn, this leads to a, a light tower of string excitations. And importantly, we have a, a unique species of most tensionless uh, string which is the most relevant object in the theory, thanks to the uniqueness of the fast T-shrinking two cycle. Uh, so the new duality frame is well-defined always. <clears throat> so let's now consider all other limits in which by definition, no unique fast T-shrinking two cycle exists. Uh, within this class of limits, uh, there arise two subclasses the first is the limit without uh, any shrinking two cycles to, to begin with. And this means uh, that no relative scalings are in play. And therefore, this indicates a homogeneous decompactification. <clears throat> um, the second subclass is the limit where uh, uh, shrinking two cycles are present, but more than one such cycle shrink together at the, at the same fastest rate. So, um, <clears throat> naively, this is a, a pathology because this leads to uh, multiple uh, most relevant critical strings in a given theory. However, by carefully analyzing the geometry of the expanding cycles, we can actually prove that the KK scale always wins against the string scale. So this has to be seen by analyzing the geometry carefully and this, this, this is seen. So in presence of a, a light tower of KK modes, uh, we learned that it's in fact a, a decompactification in disguise rather than a weakly coupled string phase. Uh, therefore, <clears throat> uh, we have by now confirmed the uh, emergent string conjecture for the Keller moduli. Uh, recall that the proposed conjecture was about the, the string emergence at a so-called, well, so to speak, the equidimensional limits at, at infinite distance. In other words, Unless the internal space decompactifies by a light KK tower, 
uh, uh, as in as in this last case, uh, the, the theory results in a weakly coupled uh, tensionless uh, uh, string theory, which in turn is to a light tower of string excitation modes. Um, I should point out that our discussion so far have been about the physics in the classical geometric setting. Everything was about classical Keller geometry. Uh, however, with only four real supercharges in the theory, we should also consider quantum corrections. They are important. And indeed, uh, we gave careful analysis of such corrections uh, in this paper. Uh, in view of time, I won't get into the details of this story, but the conclusion we drew is of course that the same picture emerges for the quantum Keller moduli as well. <clears throat> okay, so having established a general picture for the Keller moduli, we will now switch to all other moduli, which in the context of F theory are completely covered by the complex structure of elliptic Calabria manifolds. Um, for this journey, as an initial step, we will look into the eight dimensional EFTs, as I said. And surprisingly, <clears throat> it will turn out to be uh, 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 non trivial enough, even if it's just eight dimensional EFTs and just geometry, just K3s. So, so we may improve our intuitive understanding of the physics even by looking at these simple situations. And before we start this part, uh, let me point out clearly now, uh, because our upcoming discussions will be about complex structure deformations, uh, it will be much more appropriate to use the language of complex geometry rather than uh, uh, real geometry. So I will do so. In particular, rather than two cycles and four cycles, I will now say curves and surfaces. And also any dimensions from now, we refer to the complex dimensions rather than the real dimensions. I hope that this doesn't confuse you. <clears throat> so uh, let me first set a scene for you. Uh, now that we discuss F3 in eight dimensions, the internal space is a complex curve P1, the sphere, two sphere. And the seven brain configuration is described uh, as a set of points therein. <clears throat> uh, the Dilaton profile is again specified by uh, an elliptic vibration and of which total space has to be an elliptic K3 surface. So by construction, the information on string coupling is encoded in the complex structure of this K3. It's about the vibration. But part of the complex structure data, or rather most of it <clears throat> uh, in this eight dimensional case, would be, so to speak, brain moduli. After all, the brains are sitting at the, the points in this P1 where the elliptic fiber degenerates. And the degeneration loci are, of course, determined by the complex structure. So it's all about where the brains are sitting in the P1. Mathematically, the complex structure degenerations of K3s uh, are classified by these classic results, which go under the name of Kulikov models. Um, of the three types established, uh, type two and type three are at infinite distance, of which details we will discuss later. Uh, then in the current context, uh, the immediate physics question uh, is, if we can find light towers of states in those Kulikov models of type two and type three, and if we can gain any physics intuitions uh, uh, from the geometry. At this stage, <clears throat> I must point out that some earlier works exist already studying uh, type two strings on Calabiaos in the complex structure limits. Uh, they mainly relied on the beautiful language of uh, limiting hot structure, and they did find light towers, which was exciting. However, uh, it was perhaps not completely clear how to extract the universal nature of these towers. And furthermore, uh, because the analysis was done in type two setup, the open string sector was largely ignored. Our goal is then to, to understand the physics at infinite distance in F3 complex structure moduli, which by construction also covers the open string sector. So it's about all other moduli other than the Keller moduli. <clears throat> so let's be more precise about what we do. Our F3 background is an elliptic K3 over P1, which we can describe as a virus model 
uh, in this fashion. So here, F and G are degree eight and degree 12 polynomials in the base homogeneous coordinates, S and T, describing the positions on this uh, P1 base. And the discriminant delta is given as 4FQ plus 27G squared. And as I said, over the point where it vanishes, we have a degenerate fiber, uh, and this indicates uh, seven brains there. <clears throat> um, in this language, the AD algebras are described by the vanishing orders of F, G, and delta. And this is essentially the Kodaira neuron classification of codimension one singular fibers. However, all these codimension one degenerations sit at finite distance in the moduli space, only resulting in a finite enhancement uh, to non-abelian gauge dynamics. Then <clears throat> our question comes, of course, where are the infinite distance limits in the complex structure moduli? In order to start answering this, uh, I remind you that the, the table also contains the so-called uh, non-minimal singular fibers at orders famously beyond four, six, and 12. They are typically uh, uh, ignored in discussing defective physics. Um, but now we do care as we want to classify the physics at infinite distance. And no minimal fibers serve as an excellent candidate uh, for infinite distance limits. So possibly some of them will be at infinite distance because the other things are not at infinite distance. <clears throat> for a complete story, I should say that what's been ignored so far also is the potential generic singular fibers in codimension zero rather than codimension one, some of which may also see that infinite distance. So these two are potential infinite distance limits, and we may want to analyze this uh, carefully in order to uh, study the infinite distance limits. So let me now report on our classification result. Firstly, for the geometry at infinite distance, <clears throat> um, our first major task was to refine the, the known Kulikov types, the two types, type two and type three, into subtypes so that each subtype may exhibit a common characteristic feature for the effective physics. In fact, such a refinement for physicists uh, <clears throat> uh, had been known uh, at least for Kulikov type two models, thanks to this work by Klinger and Morgan. They refined type two into type two A and type two B. <clears throat> so our main contribution would be that the type three models are now also refined as type three A and type three B. Well, these are just words by now, but uh, let me continue for a little bit more. I, I will get you a bit more details uh, shortly. Um, and as it turns out, the potential infinite distance limits from a slide ago in the context of the uh, uh, Kodaira neuron classification uh, indeed lead to these different subtypes. <clears throat> So for the experts in the audience, uh, let me remark that uh, some of the candidate limits, in fact, lead to type one models at finite distance. But what's more important is that we do not miss any infinite distance limit this way because we are searching for all possible potential uh, uh, infinite distance limits through this uh, no minimal fibers in codimension one and also generic degeneration. <clears throat> uh, so far, it's all been about geometry. What about physics, of course? <clears throat> the moduli space of elliptic K3s uh, is of course viewed now as the moduli space of F3 EFTs on K3. And uh, here is a one page summary of all that can happen for the effective physics at infinite distance in complex structure moduli. Uh, indeed, each of these four subtypes leads to a distinct physical phenomenon. So, for now, let me only read the major features for you. <clears throat> so type 2A, type 3A, and type 3B lead to decompactifications, either to nine dimensions or to 10 dimensions. And type 2B corresponds to a weakly coupled string theory. And notably, as in the Keller moduli limits, the physics at infinite distance now in the complex structure moduli is again consistent with the emergent string conjecture. So it's either emergent string phase or the decompactification phase. 
Uh, in fact, the physical descriptions of type 2A and type 2B limits had long been known since uh, 96. And our, our own results are consistent with them, of course, as they must. So uh, I will start by reviewing what had been known about uh, these two upper corners. And then I will move to our story on uh, type 3 limits, uh, these two bottom corners. <clears throat> OK. Oh, but before that, uh, let me first tell you what are the Kulikov models really? <clears throat> because I, I, I think not all of you might be familiar with this, this language, at least I was not before I started this project. So <clears throat> what we are interested in is the complex structure degenerations of K3 surfaces, uh, which can naturally be described by a threefold family, the curly X here of K3 surfaces XUs, where the parameter U here sits in a unit disk. <clears throat> So this is a picture for such a degeneration as a threefold model. The degenerate surface is the central element sitting at u equals zero, the x zero, and this decomposes into a union of component surfaces, <coughs> uh, and I call them xi's. But the generic xu elsewhere than the the u equals zero point are all smooth. And, and that's how we model the degenerate K3 surface X0. Now, Kulikov model describes a degeneration of a certain control type. For the experts in the audience, uh, uh, the component surfaces XIs uh, should be uh, reduced. They have multiplicity one. And the singularities <coughs> of X0 uh, must be of a very well controlled form, the normal crossing type. And the threefold uh, curly X uh, as a whole uh, must itself be also Calabiao. But whatever they mean, whatever these extra conditions mean, uh, all of this uh, turns out not to be a restriction for the purpose of physics at least. So what do I mean by this? It is known that any degeneration, whether it's a Kulikov form or not, uh, to begin with, any degeneration <coughs> uh, uh, can be always turned into a Kulikov form by a combination of the base changes and birational transformations. So there is this mathematical theorem. <clears throat> and here, this base change thing uh, is essentially viewing the small parameter u near the u equals zero point as if even smaller parameter u to the k. u to u to the k is the base change. And the birational transformation is, of course, just about zooming in towards the brain collision. So both of them are fine operations that better not affect the physics. Therefore, uh, we can describe all complex structure uh, uh, degenerations in terms of Kulikov degeneration because these uh, the restrictions for Kulikov models are actually not restrictions for physics. Then the Kulikov degenerations have been classified into three types, type one, two, and three where only type two and type three sit at infinite distance. So we will focus on these two types. <clears throat> and here is part of the known features of these two types. Um, firstly, in type two models, as shown in this picture, the components XIs uh, form a chain of surfaces. And the adjacent component should meet at an elliptic curve. The intersection of the adjacent components should be an elliptic curve. Furthermore, there should be two transcendental two tori, uh, which shrink in the limit. And I will denote these two transcendental vanishing tori as gamma one and gamma two. These two shrinking two cycles will play a crucial role uh, later in our physics discussions. But for the moment, I'm only stating their exist existence in geometry literature. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, uh, in, in type three models, the components can intersect in a more general fashion than uh, in this chain form. Uh, also, their intersection curves uh, are, are restricted, but now to be a, a rational curve, always rational intersection. Furthermore, uh, there should only be one transcendental true torus that shrinks in the limit. Now it's just one two cycle shrinking rather than two. 
Okay, so this will be our general language from now, uh, in terms of which we will describe each type of Kulikov models in turn. So, so that's the language. Are there any questions so far? <clears throat> okay, if not, uh, let me proceed to a brief review of what had been known for type two models. Firstly, concerning the geometry of type two models, a theorem by Klinger and Morgan says that the degenerate elliptic K3, X0, can always uh, uh, be turned into a union of precisely two component surfaces, X1 and X2. And they intersect at an elliptic curve, which is the defining property of type two model, of course. Furthermore, they refine the limits into these two subtypes. Type 2A <clears throat> is the limit where the two components, X1 and X2, uh, uh, are each a rational elliptic surface, also known as uh, a DP9 surface. And the intersection curve E, X1, uh, X1 cup, <clears throat> sorry, X1 cap X2, uh, is nothing but the common elliptic fiber of these two DP9 surfaces. And this is the smooth, smooth elliptic curve. Uh, the rational basis of these two DP9s are denoted here by uh, B1 and B2. <clears throat> On the other hand, the type 2B is the limit where the two components, X1 and X2, are each a P1 vibration over the base P1. They meet at the double cover of this space, ramified over four points, which therefore is an elliptic curve. However, the geometric features of these two subtypes are rather distinct. <clears throat> what, about, what about their physics? Are they, are they related at all? <clears throat> so firstly, uh, for type 2A limits, um, the uh, vanishing two tori <clears throat> are identified as the uh, two one cycles of the intersection curve, the SA here and SB here, fibered over a vanishing one cycle, the green sigma here in the base, which encircles the intersection point P of the two base components B1 and B2, okay? <clears throat> so that's uh, the uh, gamma one and gamma two, the two shrinking transcendental two tori. <clears throat> then firstly, from the M3 point of view, uh, M2 brains uh, wrapping these uh, transcendental two tori lead to two BPS towers of light states. And viewed from F theory, we are essentially considering uh, one zero string and zero one strings encircling this uh, green, green cycle sigma. And both of them are allowed by the, the trivial monodromy around this intersection point P. So over P sits on I zero fiber. So you can fiber uh, any of these two cycles over this sigma. <clears throat> There's no monodromy here. <clears throat> so the physics is therefore proposed to be a decompactification to 10 dimensions um, due to the two towers of KK -like states. And this is uh, uh, most clearly confirmed in the dual heterotic picture, oops, uh, <clears throat> where the Keller modulus of the uh, heterotic torus is taken to infinity. <clears throat> so this really explicitly confirms the decompactification uh, 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 phenomenon in this heterotic duality frame, uh, as it has been well known. <clears throat> uh, for type 2b limits, on the other hand, the physics is very different. Apparently, the, the A cycle of the elliptic fiber shrinks so this shrinking uh, 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 SA, the one zero cycle, endowed with the two uh, uh, one cycle, the sigma one and sigma two of the elliptic curve, uh, which is the intersection of the two components, um, they form the vanishing two tori gamma one and gamma two. And they are the two transcendental vanishing two tori uh, in these type two limits. Then, M2 brains on gamma j's again lead to light towers. However, uh, 
a big difference from type 2A uh, is that uh, the M2 grain on the shrinking one cycle SA in the fiber gives a tensionless string. <clears throat> um, then this is very much unlike in the uh, type 2A case where SA was not shrinking. And in F theory, this is the geometry behind the famous sense limits describing the a weakly coupled type 2b oriented fold on the type 2b torus E. Here it can be confirmed that the winding towers uh, and the weakly coupled string tower have the same mass scale. So you can just carefully check the geometry and you confirm this. And therefore, the string tower wins because even if the uh, mass scales sit at the same uh, uh, energy scale, uh, because the string tower is much denser in the, in the spectrum, uh, it always wins if it's the same scale as the KK tower. The physics is not a decompactification as before, but rather a weakly coupled type 2B string theory still in eight dimensions. So that's been for type two models, type two Kulikov models. <clears throat> Let me now get into our results on type three Kulikov limits. So, Firstly, about our strategy, the um, <clears throat> central object underlying our geometric refinement is the, the Weierstrass version of the Kulikov model. So the Kulikov Weierstrass model, so to speak, the Kali Y, amounts to the usual fibral blowdown, uh, contracting all the exceptional fibers uh, 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 in the Kulikov model, Kali X. Then uh, each surface YU is itself a Weierstrass model over its own base BU. And the, the central surface Y0 decomposes into a number of uh, Weierstrass models YI, each of them over a certain uh, base component BI. <clears throat> um, furthermore, the genetic fibers over BI should be of Kodaira type I and I. This is because otherwise the degeneration does not obey some of the special criteria for, for, for X to be a Kulikov degeneration, <clears throat> it turns out. And we will often call YI an I and I component. <clears throat> then another relevant geometric object is obtained by further blowing down all but one base components of Y0. There can be, uh, in, in general, a lot of components. And we, we blow down all of these base components except one. <clears throat> and that's, that's the hetted Y. And by construction, uh, the new central element Y0 hat of this hetted model um, <clears throat> must have a non-minimal fiber in codimension one. Uh, this is because otherwise this hetted model, blue one, Cannot, cannot be blown up back to Kali Y, contradicting the construction. So in this context, our claim is that the degeneration is of type uh, three um, if delta, the discriminant, vanishes to order strictly bigger than 12, and of type 2A <clears throat> if the order is precisely 12. <clears throat> uh, as you might have noticed, uh, we are implicitly assuming that capital P is actually positive. So capital P was actually, capital P plus one was a number of components. So if P was zero, then Y zero to begin with would have only one component. So you cannot blow down along the base. Uh, <clears throat> and it, it turns out that this is where type 2B Kulikov models sit. So if capital P was, is zero, then there can be type 2B models. If capital P is positive, then you can have, you can characterize type three versus type 2A in terms of the vanishing orders of the non-minimal fibers in codimension one. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so uh, for this reason, we can easily distinguish type 2A from type 2B Kulikov models already in the heted single component configurations. <clears throat> However, in order to refine the type three models, uh, the heted version is not uh, good enough. And we, we need to go back to this um, 
a multi-component configuration, which is an outcome of only the fiber glow down of the Kulikov model. And here is our main theorem. <clears throat> so concerning the refinement of type three models, <clears throat> now at the level of, as I said, the Kulikov bias source model Kali Y, we claim that the bias source model of a type three Kulikov model always decomposes the central element Y zero into a chain of component surfaces where the, the, the capital P here is bigger than or equal to two, so that some middle components are always present. So first of all, it's a, it's a chain form. So you can talk about end components and middle components. And because capital P is bigger or equal to two, there will always be at least one middle component. You can at least put the model into that form. So that's part of the theorem. Um, <clears throat> then the models are grouped into type 3A and type 3B, depending on the structure of the genetic fibers. So as I discussed in the previous slide, the genetic fibers are of codata type INI over each component surface YI. However, it turns out uh, not everything can go. They are further restricted so that the genetic fibers over each middle component must be pinched in a mutually local fashion. In particular, these NIs for I from one through P minus one uh, should be all positive, strictly positive. On the other hand, the genetic fibers over the end components, uh, the end component genetic fibers can either be I zero or I n positive. In this context, uh, the twofold refinement is now obvious. Type three A, is the limits where both end components uh, or at least one are an I zero component. And this means of course that they are DP9 surfaces. And type three B is all other limits where both ends are now I n positive component with the genetic singularity of I n type with n positive. <clears throat> uh, then what will be important for physics is the codata types of the special fibers in codimension one, because they will be the, uh, the, the, the brain, brain types of the eight dimensional EFTs. Uh, while any minimal codata types can appear in a rational elliptic end, if any, the allowed fiber types on the I and positive components are restricted to be of type A or type D, which mean that the vanishing orders of FG and Delta are 00K and 23K respectively. Moreover, the D types can only arise in a degenerate end. <clears throat> so, I mean, this can only arise, of course, at the, uh, I mean, this, this restriction only arises at the degenerate component, but D types can only arise at the end components. And in fact, uh, these D types will appear precisely twice. Uh, uh, and, and this feature is already indicated in these figures by the two blue crosses at the end components that are degenerate. <clears throat> okay, so that's the geometric claim. Uh, now, rather than trying to get you any intuitions behind this geometric claim, let me now get to the more interesting part, which is the physics. So let me start with type 3A limits, <clears throat> where uh, at least one end is an I0 component, uh, which intersects an I n positive component. So let's zoom in towards such an intersection uh, of, say, the first component and the second component, Y0 and Y1. As in here, we, we are now zooming in. Um, of course, they are fibered over their rational base components, B0 and B1. So the genetic fibers over B0 are smooth because it's I0 component, but those over B1 are pinched with uh, its A cycle collapsing. <clears throat> and this pinched fiber of type I and positive uh, 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 from this B1 kicks in uh, into B2, uh, sorry, B0 uh, uh, without further enhancement. So we have this common I N fiber uh, at the intersection P. Then the interpretation goes very similarly to the type 2A case. 
One difference is that we expect only one vanishing true torus because we are now in type three rather than type two. <clears throat> and we can easily spot this true torus gamma one. It is this uh, shrinking uh, A cycle fibered over the vanishing one cycle sigma uh, in this space, which in encircles the intersection point P. Importantly, there is a non-trivial IN monodromy around P because here we have an IN fiber, which is degenerate. So the B cycle cannot be fibered over sigma, and we therefore only get a single vanishing two torus rather than two. Now from M3 point of view, M2 brains wrapping gamma one <clears throat> lead to one BPS tower of light states. And viewed from F theory, this means that we are considering one zero string encircling the green one cycle in the base this sigma. And this is allowed once again by the IN monodromy, because one zero is, a, is an eigenvector of this IN monodromy. <clears throat> uh, the proposal for the physics is therefore uh, that in the limit, the space-time decompactifies to uh, nine dimensions from eight dimensions due to this single KK-like tower. Uh, this can be achieved in the dual hydraulic frame by taking not only the Keller modulus to infinity, but also the complex structure to infinity at the same rate. And in the paper, we have indeed uh, confirmed this behavior in the hydraulic frame through the explicitly known duality map available for E7 times EA models, at least. <clears throat> okay, now it turns out that the F3 picture here, uh, which you might think is already clean enough, leads to uh, yet another intriguing interpretation of the light tower uh, in terms of an affine extension of the E-type algebra to E-hat. Uh, in fact, I wanted to spend uh, at least a couple of slides on this, but my time is really almost up. So uh, let me not do so, but let me still point out that uh, through, this, um, through this affine interpretation, we can easily read off the maximal gauge algebras in nine dimensions just the outcome of this analysis. And we can confirm that this uh, uh, allowed maximal gauge algebras in nine dimensions computed in this uh, F3 context uh, uh, completely agree with the recent uh, result in the heterotic, heterotic uh, uh, literature. And this we take as another piece of supporting evidence for our decompactification proposal to nine dimensions uh, for type three amorals. <clears throat> Okay, and lastly, very quickly for type 3B models, uh, now every surface component <clears throat> is an IN positive component. Both ends are also IN positive components. Again, there arises uh, one vanishing two torus, just like in type 3A, we identify this as the one zero A cycle over the vanishing base one cycle around the intersection point. Uh, this from M theory gives a KK-like tower once again through the M2 brain wrapping. However, uh, M2 wrapped on the fibril A cycle itself gives a tensionless string. And importantly, uh, this string is globally defined, unlike in the type 3A situation. There we had at least one end component say here, uh, over which A cycle is not collapsing. So this tensionless string was not globally defined, but now it is globally defined. So this weakly coupled type 2B string is present just like in sense limit, that is as in, as in type 2B limits, type 2B Kulikov limits. However, this time the KK scale turns out to be lighter than the string scale, already implying a decompactification. Uh, one might then naively think that the, the theory decompactifies to nine dimensions. However, as it turns out, what happens in the F3 frame uh, is that the complex structure of the type 2B torus degenerates with, with the Keller volume fixed. So we end up having two uh, KK towers. And here the degeneration is implied by the fact that the O plane should collide uh, for the vanishing order uh, reason. But uh, uh, in any case, it happens that it's in fact uh, decompactification to 10 dimensions. So that's our claim. Uh, we, we claim that the theory now decompactifies to 10 dimensions for type 3B Kulikov models. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> there was some details. Let me now quickly summarize. The goal we had was to, to first test 
if light towers of states arise at all at infinite distance in the moduli space? And if so, to also clarify the nature or the origin of those states. Uh, the conjectural claim we wanted to test was that the light states are either KK mode or excitation modes of a, a critical string that is asymptotically weakly coupled. So we took the non-perturbative F theory as a testing ground and have analyzed the four dimensional EFTs at infinite distance in Keller moduli um, uh, and, and, and the eight DF theory EFTs in the complex structure moduli. The conclusion, just to simply put, is that the geometry exhibits universal characteristic features in the asymptotic regime of the moduli space in such a way that the resulting physics always conforms with the emergent string conjecture. So that's what I wanted to convey to you today. Uh, thank you very much for, for your patience. Thank you. Thank you for your nice talk. So any questions? Um, no question. Excuse me. So could you go back to the, uh, the first or second slide? So where you show the ratio between conjectures? Oh, yes, yes. <clears throat> Oops, too many slides, sorry. Oops. Uh, yes. <clears throat> oh, thank you. So, so uh, I'm not familiar with the, these conjectures, so I, I have very really naive questions. So, sure. uh, so, so you have an arrow from emergent string conjectures to distance conjectures. Yes. So, so, uh, so what does this arrow mean? So, ah, okay. So, <clears throat> so as I said, okay. So I've only discussed these two conjectures in this talk. Uh, the distance conjecture, as I said, is about the appearance of. Uh, Tower of light states at infinite distance. Uh, but this does not claim uh, what kind of nature this tower of states has. Now, uh, the emergent string conjecture claims that uh, at infinite distance, a tower of light states of a certain, uh, 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 with a certain property should appear. And that's the sort of uh, stronger statement, which implies the distance conjecture, which is weaker. So in, in this sense, it is a, in a sense, refinement, but also the latter implies the former. I see. So imagine string conjecture is more uh, stronger than distance conjecture. Uh, yes. I mean, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I see. In, in a sense, yes, yes. I see. And, and then, so I, I also uh, yeah, have one, one more question. So, so what's the ratio between distance conjectures and no global symmetry? Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, all of these conjectures are very, very much connected. So I... I <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to go through all of this, so I have to think um, distance conjecture is about, um, indeed, it's, it's about appearance of, okay, so particularly for the infinite distance limit in which the uh, gauge coupling is going to zero, for example, that's one infinite distance limit you can imagine. However, the distance conjecture says that if you try to approach that infinite distance limits in the moduli space, then there should arise an infinite tower of very light states. So the effective theory breaks down. This means that you cannot actually reach there. So in that sense, you cannot have a, a gauge symmetry that is uh, uh, becoming global because that can only happen at infinite distance where the effective theory breaks down. So in that sense, uh, in a sense, uh, distance conjecture implies no global symmetry. Maybe that's the connection I, I wanted to. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for question. Any other questions? Uh, let me ask one question. So um, you, um, you in, at some point you, you consider the, uh, the case that the discriminant, discriminant is uh, larger than 12. Yes. So, uh, so you, you can take any value or up to 24 or something. Oh. Good question. Um, um, 
I think, okay, I have to think carefully, but I think um, you can make it very large if you like by this freedom of what I call the base change, where was it? <clears throat> Uh, what I call this uh, base change. Oops. Yeah, this base change will uh, be uh, will allow you to increase the vanishing order as much as you like. But I think you can always put it in such a way that the vanishing order is less than twenty. I think I, I have to be. I have to check. But I think twenty four was in some sense maximal, if oh. I, if I recall correctly. But yeah, I see. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. For uh, and one, one one more. So uh, <laughs> you also consider the case that the uh, um, the decompactification is uh, up to ten dimensional. Yes. So, uh, so it, is this ten dimensional case? It's a, a ten dimensional heteroclick string, or which yeah. string? So, <clears throat> good question. So, once again, the type two A. Okay, let me first show you the global picture. Yeah. So this is the global thing, the global global picture of the uh, corners of the uh, modulite space. <clears throat> so here you see uh, type two A Kulikov models correspond to 10 dimensional decompactification. And here, the right duality frame is the heterodic. Uh -huh. uh, here is another 10 dimensional decompactification, but here it's about the weakly covered type two. Uh, it's about type two B setup. Because the type uh -huh. two string uh, in 10 dimension can happen in mm -hmm. type three B Kulikov models and heterodic to 10 dimension can happen for type two A Kulikov models. I see. And this heteroclick is uh, E8 cross E8 form? Good, very good. So <clears throat> that's the hallmark of the distinction between type 2A and type 3A. <clears throat> so yeah, I didn't have time to discuss the affine algebra and loop algebra extensions, which is actually very nice in view of detecting the gauge algebras. But mm -hmm. now you ask. Um, so the, the quick answer is that indeed, the type 2A to 10 dimensions is indeed E8 times E8. Uh -huh. However, to nine dimensions is uh, allowing for, of course, lots of rooms for slightly broken gauge algebras. And this is natural because for in the heterodic duality frame, you can imagine turning on some Wilson lines along the single S1 in 9D, mm -hmm. right? However, in 10D, you cannot. You cannot turn on any, any gauge background because there is no internal thing in 10D. Right. So you cannot, you cannot imagine breaking EA times EA into mm -hmm. any smaller subgroups. However, in 9D, you may imagine, and indeed, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't discuss yeah. this, but indeed it happens that in 9D, all sorts of uh, smaller Higgs algebras can happen due to the, in heterodic language, the Wilson line, non-trivial Wilson lines along the single S1, which is not decompactified. And uh, interestingly, and also as a supporting evidence, our decompactification picture um, in this nine dimensional case, um, uh, the, we could easily classify the possible Higgsing of this EA times E8 in the context of F3 geometry. And then there was another completely different line of works by uh, this group, Granada et al., uh, who classified purely from the heterodic uh, torus context, uh, in the context of, of course, Wilson lines, what kind of Higgsing can happen. So they classified what can happen for the gauge algebra in 90 uh, mm -hmm. using all sorts of Wilson lines you can think of for a single circle. And they had this classified, they classified 90 algebras and these maximal ones, they had a nice table. And we also easily read off the 90 maximal non-abian algebras and they completely match. So indeed in 90, you can have anything in the mm -hmm. heterodic picture, it's obvious, but also in the F3 context, uh, by taking this limit through the non-minimal fibers, we could realize all sorts of uh, Higgs the phases of EA times EA, which can also be confirmed in the heterodic dual phase. Yes. Yeah. I see. I see. Great. However, as you say, as you, as you, like you, like, like, like you suggested, indeed, in 10D, only EA times EA. Yeah. That's oh. intuitively clear. Yes. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. All right. Any other questions? Okay. If not, let's thank uh, the speaker again. Thank you very much. <clears throat>